Very good morning from Montreal. Good afternoon to Ampuria Brava, Spain, and South Africa's finest, Gary Smith. How are you, Gary? <laughs> hey, very good, Regan. Thank you. In my old hometown, Ampuria Brava, doing what you've been doing for quite a while now, coaching, coaching yeah. um, the teams. You're doing some tunnel coaching right now. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Great. Always loved Ampuria Brava. Haven't been here uh, for a while now, so it's great to be back. And uh, yeah, I'm coaching the Qatar Tigers, the four-way team, their the number one four-way team. And hopefully in a few weeks, Hayabusa will arrive here, the Belgium team, world champions. And uh, hopefully they can come out of lockdown and start jumping. So they've not been out of Belgium for a while at the moment? Yeah, they've been in, they, they were supposed to, in October last year, they had a camp planned in Portugal because that was the only place that they could train or the only place open and they didn't make the camp. The, the Belgian military stepped in and said because of COVID, it's not essential. So they stopped them. So their last activity, tunnel and jumping, was in September last year. So they haven't done nothing. So they, they can, they're eager to get out and then obviously they always feel that they're a little bit behind. Uh, the US teams that have been training and the French uh, that, that have trained. So where were you just before coming to Ampuria Bravo in Spain? Um, I was at home in Netherlands, uh, which has become a new home, Texel, the beautiful island. Um, and I was there for a month. And before that, in uh, mid-January to mid-February, uh, I was lucky enough to go to Qatar, Doha, for the first time uh, for me. So I traveled there and they held a simulation meet of the SISM, which they are due to hold in November this year. So there was kind of like a little practice mini meet that they had. So it was like a test event. Well, what a crazy time we've been having with this COVID. 12 months now, really disrupting everybody's plans. But I'm glad you're managing to do some travel and keep some work. But Gary, I want to I want to go back to the very beginning. I want to find out a little bit about you and your your start of career. Some interesting stories here, and it's something we don't normally get to uh, hear about, uh, how you got to where you are now. But you had an interesting start in life. A lot of skydivers and full-time skydivers parallel an interesting start like yours, that you were in around aviation to begin with, with your father. And a lot of people that we know started off like that and became full-time skydivers and stayed with it all the time. But you didn't. You went into the real world for a little bit and then came back into skydiving. Tell me about growing up and what it was like with your pilot father. Yeah, I mean, we, we were, as you can imagine, either having a, a father as a skydiver or as a pilot, um, we were always on the on the drop zone or on the airfield in, in a small town, Freyhead in South Africa. And uh, so we were there every weekend um, uh, uh, having uh, barbecues, bries as we call them in South Africa. And I would just be watching these guys jumping out round parachutes in those days. And my father was an instructor uh, pilot and he offered my brother, when, who my older brother, um, when he got to 16, he said, I'll teach you to fly. And when my turn came, I said, no, I I'd like to jump out of a plane first. And uh, it was just from sitting on the, the drop zones or on the airfield watching these parachutes come down that uh, that's kind of for me how it started. And uh, so I was still young then. I was 15, just turning 16. And, I, and through him, uh, he actually flew my jump, my, my really? first jump. He, he was flying. So um, it was fantastic. And later, my brother also flew for me. My brother also flew my, my jump. And I never, I sometimes regret it, but I never got my pilot's license. When you did that first jump, did you know on landing that you wanted to do another one? Or did it take you a few days or, or did you know straight away? Straight away, straight away. I mean, I was nervous as we all are. Um, and and <laughs> it was round parachutes. And I have to be honest, the first seven jumps, I was so light. I, uh, I've always been so skinny at school. I never landed on the drop zone. They would drop me out on the plane and I would go all over. And I couldn't work out, was I bad or was the spot bad? What was happening? So with the competitiveness in, I think, in each human, I thought, hey, I've got to do better. I've got to, I can land on the airfield. And it took me, I think, seven jumps before I even landed on the airfield. But I loved it. Uh, I loved it from a start. So just from hanging around parachutes, very quiet, as nowadays when you open on a square parachute, of course, you've got your slider, which you can now remove. 
but just hanging there and going straight down or backwards as I was in those days, I, I loved it. it. It was something that uh, I would dream, even when I was at school Mondays to Friday, I was dreaming and living for the weekends. Were you athletic before that, before you started jumping? Were you involved in other sports at school? Yeah, I was lucky enough. I played very good sport at school. I played cricket, I played rugby, tennis, golf. I, I, I was very, I don't want to say natural, but I, ball sports came very easy to me. And uh, my brother and I were both very good in, in sports. So what year was that first jump? 83. Uh, 83. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I was in standard nine at school, which, uh, which is good. I mean, it, it's pretty young. And I still had one more year of school. And then I, I went military for two years, um, which then I jumped less. And then I went into university to study law um, in, in a, a city called Peter Maritzburg. And they also had a drop zone there. So I could do some jumping. And in fact, that's kind of when my team jumping started. But uh, at right then, there was no, no sign for me of making a, a career out of skydiving. I was uh, set to become an, an attorney, a lawyer. When you went to university, where were you at? Were you jumping? What kind of jump numbers were you at then? Um, probably about 160 to 180. In, okay. And yeah. Yeah. And you actually qualified as a lawyer and you went into law for a while, didn't you? Yes. I did uh, five years of studying, a uh, Bachelor of Commerce, and then specialized in LLB, in Bachelor of, uh, of Law. And then I worked in an attorney's firm for two years as an article clerk, wrote my exams. I still had one exam to finish, to be honest. Um, and then at the same time, I kind of was selected to jump for South Africa with, with Solly, with uh, the good mates. and. I had been to, uh, in 1991, to my first world championship in, uh, um, in, in those days it was Czechoslovakia in Luchanek and 93 in Arizona, Eloy. And that's kind of when my studying came to an end and my, my two years of articles. And I had to make a decision, what do I do? And, and I had a, a good discussion that I'll never forget with the partners, my senior partners in the law firm and the the picture that they painted uh, for me of law was so terrible that I thought, I can't believe they, they're still doing this. But they, they kind of convinced me to get out of it. They said, go and, go and do what you, what you love. And uh, I couldn't work out, was it because I was a bad attorney or were, were they being uh, serious on it? But I went to the US 1995 and, uh, and that was it. From then on, those were the days that we could still live in trailers, camp in tents. And I think people still do it today, but not as much. You know, there when you went to a drop zone in, in the land, in Zephyr Hills, it was just people in trailers and, you know, living in tents and living day by day, eating Ramon noodles to survive. But it, we were not alone. There were many of us doing it. It's a big part of anybody in aviation not only skydiving but many aviation people have got this story where they've had a career had an opportunity which could have took them in one direction with financial security and all the rest that comes with it or following your passion and going down the route a lot of us had which you can make money at too but you know it's a big decision in life to make that change and it, it comes to a lot of people who want to go full-time in aviation yeah no, you know what, uh, Regan, it's, it's a funny uh, scenario because right now where I am, I would never change a thing and I would do the same thing again. I'd follow my passion. But the funny thing is I have a now, Luca, you would know, remember him, he's now 19 years old. He's a skydiver. He, he, he's, he's got, I think, 150 jumps already. And he, and he is not hooked on skydiving, but it's something that he wants to go work in a tunnel. He, he wants to go do the skydiving life kind of that I did. And I'm the one that's trying to go, I'm being the devil's advocate, trying to go, well, maybe not here, maybe not there. This is not the same as when we did it. So it, it's funny, it, it, it's there, the opportunities are there. I see them, I view them a little bit different uh, to myself than I do now for my own son as a father. So uh, I kind of have to bite my own lips sometimes and just say, hey, keep quiet, Gary, let him do what he's doing, you know. I, I think uh, if you can offer the possibilities to show both sides, on a balanced, you know, thought process, then they, 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 you, you can't ask for more than that. Once yeah, something has been presented, exactly. the options. No, exactly. So then you're in the states. You you you, you just finished because the team with Solly 
and the other guys that stopped then, didn't it, after the championships? In, in we, we jumped, we competed in 95, yeah. um, where we came, I believe, fifth in, in gap. And then we thought we could do better. And then we went in 1997 to uh, Turkey um, and we got third there. And, and kind of that was the end of the South African team. We'd, we'd run out of budget. We'd run out of, we, we knew that unless we became US or we had a big sponsor as a South African team, we could not do any better than what we were doing. The gap was, although we came third, there was still a big gap between the US and France who were number one and number two or two and number one in, in in those years so it kind of was evident that we had to do this full time and uh, and eventually then we lived in uh, Deland, Solly and I, in fact we all stayed in the US. Um, uh, Robbie Spencer is now running a, a drop zone up north, first he went to Rhode Island, now he's in California. Fred Whitsett went down to uh, Miami which was Homestead, now Skara of Miami and Solly and I stayed in Deland. And, uh, and then we eventually, through three, four, five years, we managed to change our, um, our residency to the US so we could compete for the US. We both got green cards. Solly is now a citizen there living uh, uh, with, uh, with fantastic family in Deland. And, um, and then we joined up with uh, Joey and Doug um, to become Deland Magic. And Deland Magic, was that after the Optic Nerve team, or was that before? Yes, yes. Yeah, I skipped through Optic Nerve, but that was kind of when Solly and I were transitioning through. Right. Um, so, so we were then, we, I think we even attended US Nationals, where we were um, a guest team, because Solly and I were obviously South African. So we could compete, but we could not, we are not eligible for, for medals. And then, uh, yeah, and that, and that for us, it was also fantastic. Uh, in the sense that we were coaching and we were learning and free fall as we're going. And I, I, and I always feel with without, uh, if you are a coach and you can actually get inside and jump with the team, you're actually learning all, all the time. Yes. So it's it's invaluable. Yes. So Dylan Magic starts, what a great lineup, you, Solly, Doug and Joey, powerhouse of four-way. And that's when four-way started to really change, really ramp up, didn't it? Yeah, we definitely hit, um, I mean, we were on the outsides watching, eager to get in. And obviously we had to get our residency there. Joey and Doug had just um, come off a World Cup team, which was Generation FX. And so we joined forces and we, and we obviously had our mentality and, and their mentality. And, and, and in, uh, I think if we all sat down together, we'd all agree it was not always easy. We kind of had some boxing matches and... Uh, you know, definitely some uh, disagreements on how to do things. But at the end of the day, we had so much drive and passion for it that we made we made things work. And I think right now, um, Doug, we haven't seen as much. I'm still in contact with him. But with Joey, we've become so much better friends that sometimes we were when the team was going in, in, in our hottest. It was tough. It, it was like a business that we were doing. You know, we weren't always the best of friends. It was not always very easy, but kind of we, we respected each other and we worked hard together. Yeah. And having those experiences and knowing how tough it gets, that's got to help you with being a coach as well, because you see all these dynamics in teams all the time when you're coaching and, you know, you, you've been around coaching now. How long has it been, Gary, since you've started? Oh, a long time. I, I mean, we were coaching because the, the way that it worked for us, we were in the US in 95 and we had no money. So we had to then coach. So while we were competing, we were coaching. And of course, we were not top level coaches. But as you were saying, we were learning as we were going along. And uh, I've, I've had uh, some fantastic, I mean, I remember you guys coming across with, with your team and coaching and all of that. Uh, it, you, you'd, although we were still competitor and that was my big passion, we were coaching for money. So I've basically been coaching since 1995 yeah. and, and every team that you coach comes with different individuals, different challenges as a coach. Um, although you can teach them technique, the most important thing is to teach them to work together as a team. Yes. And that is exactly what we saw in you and a lot of teams have seen in you as well. You know. It, do you think that comes from your athletic background as a kid, having been in, in sports, do you think, or is it just your philosophy, your mentality? Where do you think that comes from, that understanding? 
I think I think a bit of all. I mean, I don't think I think for sure it, it's come from you learn it uh, for sure um, as the more teams you work with. But at the end of the day, I think it's also personality. Yes. You know, uh, I think I have a, a bit of a, um, a strength that I can sit with a group and you can recognize very quickly where's your your strengths and weaknesses in each personality. And then it's a case of how do you make them work as a team? And sometimes you can play the hard ball and tell everybody exactly how to do it. But sometimes if you play that ball, it's not always going to work. The team's going to shatter. And, and, and uh, for me, I think the success I've had is the fact that I can make the teams believe in each other and not only in themselves, you know. And, and no matter at, at, at what team, I mean, even at the top higher whistle will say, sometimes we've also had some rough times where we've had to sit down and have one-on-ones with each other. And there's been tears in the beginning. And eventually we've made things work. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think as part of a team, allowing yourself to be open like that and to drop your defenses, that's a big part of it too. For sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's uh, for me, I, I only want to coach a team like that. I have with Qatar now, it's a little bit uh, different. With, with the Arabic world, they don't like to point fingers at each other. Right. And sometimes I say to them, I want you to tell him to do this or to do that. And they will rather just keep quiet because that's kind of in their culture. But the more we sit and we talk about it, we've had some good, especially recently, we've had some very good debriefs with them where they kind of open up a little bit and say, yeah, we have to tell each other more and we have to do this. And sometimes with the Western culture that we have of or the US, it almost goes the other way around. You almost have to say to somebody, hey, you have to become a better team player right now yeah. and, and, uh, and, and actually accept that you are also making mistakes because it's quite easy in our culture to point the finger at and the, the other one and say, well, he's doing this to me and he's pushing me or she's doing this, she's doing that. When they're Arabic world, it's the other way around. They just keep quiet. Yeah. They just go, it's easier for them or they don't like to offend each other. So they just keep quiet. They don't say anything. And then I feel we're not growing anyway. Any, you know, it's not getting any better. Yeah. When you get a team, like you've got the teams at the top of the game now, you know, Qatar Tigers are always up there in the top five. And Hayabusa, number one in the world, indoor and outdoor. It's hard to understand where you find those little tweaks and how you get a few more percentage out of competition when it's at such a high level already. Yeah, it's tough. There's Make no mistake. And, and I can only compliment not myself, but the whole team. We, we sit down together and we find it. It's not me that finds it. I know I'm the driver a lot, a lot with, with Hayabusa, but it's with their ideas as well. There's no ways that you can be an outside coach and, and put the fine little tweaks and I need to hear from them what they're feeling in the tunnel and, and in free fall. So when we land, it's an open discussion on, on sometimes on block technique. I try and come up with some ideas, but for sure, I, I, I don't uh, I don't only compliment myself with it. It's, it's all of us. It's a big team working together. Yeah. When you think about yourself in competition and your four-way days and your championships, which which competition comes to mind as being the one that fills your heart more than any other? Which is the one that you have the strongest feelings about? Oh, there's many. I mean, you know what, what always comes to mind is we used to always say we, we never had a meet where we had 10 perfect rounds. And you'll hear some coaches will say, you'll never do your best 10 rounds. And, and yes, I believe it, but I, I want to say no, there has to be a, a place where you have your your 10 best, you know, and and I must be honest, for, for mine, I, I don't, I can't uh, uh, list or I can't name a competition where I think we were at our best. We, we won sometimes, we, we won in uh, Croatia, was fantastic, it was the first, so that one will always uh, be in my mind, especially the round 10, we jumped very late at night out of the helicopter with clouds, we could hardly see the teams in front of us under the canopy. So, so that one to me would always stand out, uh, you know, as the best. And then, unfortunately, when we, for me, when I won my second world championship in Gira, it was hampered by the fact that we had bad weather, and and it was a different meet. I think we won that meet on five or six rounds, five rounds. Some teams had made six. So, in a way, it was the same for everybody. So, although people will say, "Well, that was an easy one. It was only five rounds." I sometimes go on the negative side and say, hey, mentally, it was a tough, it was a tough meet because you always had a jump in your head and you're going, are we going to go today? Are we not going to go? Are we going to go? Are we not going to go? 
and it's easier to, to arrive on a drop zone and have loose guys and just jump. So I think the Giro one was probably one of the toughest mentally and the one that I enjoyed the most, probably Croatia. For yourself, with the last 12 months, I'm sure you've found yourself at home a lot more than normal with traveling almost full time. How have you found that, that having that downtime? In the beginning, I loved it. For sure, it was great to be home and and see. Obviously, spend time with my wife Suzanne uh, more than we've ever been. And at some stage, we thought, "Hey, how are we ever going to survive this? We've never been, you know, one more than one month together." Yeah. But it was it was amazing. The weather was good in Holland. It was a perfect summer. Um, and and uh, of course, I enjoyed uh, watching my uh, being at home with my sons, watching them play sport. But eventually, as the lockdowns got stricter and stricter. Um, you then um, start to worry a little bit about when am I going to get back to work again? What am I going to do? Do I need to change my job? Do I need to look for something? So I've been fortunate enough that Qatar has managed to uh, find places where we could train and I could through the military special forces paperwork, I could get to travel. Um, but it hasn't been much and, and it hasn't been much. And, and on the other side, I always said to Hayabusa now who, who are also military and have done nothing for, let's call it six, six months probably now, by now, they are lucky that they are salaried. They have a military salary so they can, although they are worried about their goals, at the end of the day, they still have money. They still have an income that's, that can help feed family and keep them going. So. Yeah, it's an interesting team dynamic as well with Hayabusa swapping out a member, Dave going out onto being above and uh, Michelle coming in there as well. And how, how is that working out? I, I think it brought new energy to the team. Like I've, I've never seen them. I mean, they were going great. I mean, after Australia, um, it was a case of when do they make the switch out with, uh, with Dave uh, moving to video and obviously Mike coming in. Coming in. And eventually when the COVID, just before the COVID hit, they said, hey, we're gonna make the change. And uh, we, we have the time. And uh, unfortunately they haven't jumped enough. So th there's always that, there's no doubt on their minds, but from a coaching point of view, I'm thinking we need more numbers. We need more numbers, but they, they eager to go. And I must be honest with Mike coming in. I haven't met a guy for a long, long time that is as motivated and does as much homework and he learns so quickly. He yeah. does one, th he does a thing and we say to him, no, not this way, do it the other way and incredible. He learned and he doesn't forget it. So, so in that sense, it's been great. And, and I also think the team, uh, we always have Dave there. Dave always adds his little five cents in the debriefs at the end of the day. He'll say, oh, I think this is rotating too much or this and that. And he also has learned that things will be different in a piece between him and uh, Bob. It's now different between, and with Bob and, and Mike. They turn things slightly different, uh, different sizes, different shapes um, in, in, inside the, the subgroup. But I think Dave is enjoying it. He's really motivated to be the best video man out there and to be the best he can be. And, and the team are enjoying having Mikey in the team. Yeah, great. It's always good, always good to switch things up, isn't it? And get new energy yes. and new blood. Yeah, absolutely. And for you, Gary, what's, what's the plans for the next few months going up into summer and for the rest of the summer? Well, we, we hope to hear in the next month, we hope to hear a definite on the Mondial. You know, I mean, yeah. The, the little that I can put together, it sounds like Russia wants to go ahead. They want to have this Mondial. They've put the, the groundwork in. Um, the IPC or FAI, uh, um, I think they they have approved it, but I don't know if it's a, if it's a go right now. So kind of we're saying we've been told that there will be a final decision coming uh, coming as to yes or no. And and for me right now, we're going as it's, it's a go. So we're going to start training for it, uh, you know, focusing on that, not that much, although we're in the tunnel, um, we're focusing on outdoors uh, for the Mondial in Russia and we hope it goes ahead. So for me personally, it's going to be drop zones, hopefully drop zones and very little tunnel until we get to um, Russia. Good, good. And outside of work, the opportunities where you have a bit of time for yourself, what, what's your passion at the moment? What, what, what do you like to do when you're not working? I'm in the old man's game playing golf. It's it's a uh, it's something I love to do. I think it mentally it's incredible, uh, a, a incredible sport, incredible uh, game. 
and I love it. I'm outdoors with a golf bag. I, I'm even now in Puria. I have I brought my golf clubs along. So when I have days off, I try and find a little golf course and I go and hit around. Mm -hmm. And I find it such a challenging game. And uh, just being outside, uh, I really I really enjoy it. I do a bit of running, but as the body gets older, I run less and less and less. Walk, run, walk, run. I saw. Uh, uh, what, what can I saw a post, a couple of posts uh, from you with you walking out in in the snow. Yes. Um, yeah. Heads off to you, man. And, yeah, and I'm, trying to, I'm trying to walk a couple of hours a day if I can, trying to do something. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. And uh, I mean, when I'm running, I'm running 30, 40 minutes. It used to be longer. Um, and and I think with walking, I could probably go an hour outdoors. But golfing, I really love. Really love golf. Well, Gary, it's been an absolute pleasure to see you and to catch up with you. Know, it's uh, always. Good times when we're um, when we get to meet. I hope we get to see each other somewhere face to face. Yeah, let's hope, Regan. I mean, let's hope we can all get through this. And one thing I wanted to add is, as I was going, I always said to teams. In fact, I was saying it to uh, the people at the at the Windor uh, staff, is that although everyone's uh, struggling through this, I, I always go that you just have to look around you and see that there's always people way worse off than what we are. You know, and and uh, and. As much as there's complaints about this and wearing masks and doing whatever and, or not wearing masks if you don't want to, I always go, uh, you know, I have consider myself fortunate, but I know all the people around me. We're fortunate considering if you're looking at people, on, you know, in, in other places, there are people really, really struggling. And it's not only COVID, it could be people and kids in Africa, it could be all over. So I always go, take one step back, take a deep breath and think, hey, we, it's not as bad as, as, as we all think. We'll get through this. Yeah, it really is. And that's a, a good sentiment to leave it on. Really is. Gary, Thank you. enjoy your time on Pure Brava. Enjoy your coaching. Hope you get some uh, good golf done. And, uh, <laughs> Thank you. I'll, I'll see you soon. You take care. Yeah. Cheers, Regan. Thank you, mate.